So hello everyone, my name is Nick Valesky. I work for our USU Extension Integrated Pest Management Program. And with my position, that entails working with our state's vegetable producers on insect and disease management through outreach, education, and different research trials. And then for this last segment of this webinar, I'm gonna be talking about different product recommendations for vegetable pests. So the other night, I went around to different garden centers around town and I just to kind of look at the pesticide selections they have available. And it can be, it was kind of overwhelming just to see the hundreds of options out there. So I would imagine it would be just as daunting for a homeowner or a home gardener or a small farmer even to come and try to decide what they need. So I think as garden center employees, what you can do to help them out is ask some questions. You could first ask, what are you seeing or what are you trying to control? Like what insect or disease and have them describe it. And then secondly, ask what vegetable crop is being affected because that can help narrow down the possibilities. And kind of um, Mike discussed this in the first presentation, but a lot of our pesticide products in the stores or garden centers, they're sold as like concentrates. So they need to be mixed with water. They can be marketed as RTU, which is the acronym ready to use in like a spray bottle. And then there's dust and granule products as well. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to just talk about five different types of pests and the products that we can recommend to customers on how to control them. And this first group is caterpillar pest. So a customer might come in and say, oh, they have worms or they, they might use the word caterpillars. But basically these are just the larval stage of different moth or butterfly species. So some common ones that we see are the tomato fruit worm. And this is more commonly called a corn earworm. We have cabbage loopers, diamondback moths, and imported cabbage worms. These are very common on our brassica crops. So broccoli, cauliflower, kale. And then we have different hornworm species, which are the big green ones that like our tomato crops. And then of course, there's several different armyworm species and cutworm species. And they all have somewhat of a wide host range of vegetable crops and a lot of related weed species. They're a problem because they have these chewing mouth parts and that allows them to create these holes in the foliage. And I have a video here I'll play. So this is, I believe a monarch caterpillar, but really all caterpillars, they have this same mouth part. Here's kind of a mic microscopic image of it. And you can see they have like, they're called mandibles and they just can chew on the leaves, the stems of the plant. So here it is just gnawing away on that leaf. And sometimes they'll even eat the fruit. So like here's the tomato fruit worm eating a hole inside our tomato plant. And then here's a picture of the corn earworm, which is the same species as the tomato fruit worm, but it's eating the ear of the sweet corn. So customers might be seeing this in their garden and they're going to want to know how they can control it. So for caterpillars, we, I listed several active ingredients, which are found in a lot of common garden center products that are labeled for caterpillar control. So like we talked about earlier, a lot of your stores might sell different brands or different products, but a lot of them they're going to have, they're going to be listed with an active ingredient. And I sorted them by mode of action. And the mode of action is essentially the way a pesticide product kills the insect. And these classifications, they come from the IRAC, which is the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. So they have the, they're all grouped by numbers. So the first one, for example, is mode of action one. We have carborol and malathion. And these, it kills by affecting the 
insects, nervous or muscle systems. And a lot of our insecticide products that we do buy, when you spray that onto the insect directly, that's what's happening. It's affecting its muscles or insect or muscles or nervous systems. Next, I have spinosad, which is a natural substance. It comes from a soil bacterium, which I know we talked about earlier, and it's also toxic to pests. But because it's a soil bacterium, it's listed as organic. And this is highly effective on caterpillar species. And then sometimes we'll see products that have multiple active ingredients. So I know there's a product, um, it's the Benide brand, but it's a bug and slug killer. So it has both spinosad and iron phosphate in it. The spinosad kills the caterpillar species and then the iron phosphate, the slug species. So, and you might see that as well. So I know like a lot of these pyrethrin products, they have the pyrethrin and then another product as well. And then BT is the Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a microbe that's found naturally in the soil and it's toxic to caterpillar species, especially, especially those early instars or the smaller caterpillars when they first hatch. And this mode of action 11, it kills because when the caterpillar consumes it, it'll, it affects their mid gut. So that's how, that's its mode of action. So if you're familiar with BT corn, that's the GMO corn where it has that BT genetics within it. So when caterpillar pests try to eat it, that's what kills them. And then neem oil is a naturally occurring pesticide. It's very popular with organic growers and its mode of action is unknown, but we do is unknown. But what we do know is it's effective at suffocating the insect or interfering with its hormones. And then this big group here, mode of action three. Um, so this, okay, so mode of action three, this also works by um, interfering with their nervous system and muscles. So, so, so there's products that contain the active ingredient cyflutrin, gamma cyhalothrin, permethrins, pyrethrins, bifenthrins, and zeta cypermethrins. Those are all labeled for caterpillar control. So the next group I want to touch on is beetle species. And in most cases, um, for so beetles are in the order Coleoptera, the adults are the damaging life stage because they have those chewing mouth parts. However, sometimes the larval stage can cause damage to our vegetable crops as well. But some common species I listed are the Western corn rootworm, the asparagus beetle, there's a spotted asparagus beetle, Colorado potato beetle, Colorado potato beetle, then there's several species of flea beetles as well. And then on our cucurbit crops, we might see the spotted cucumber beetle or the striped cucumber beetle. And then we have a three line potato beetle that we might see on our tomatillo crops. So here's some images I just wanted to show of different beetle damage that we might see. So you can see here on the cucurbit leaves, this is all from the cucumber beetles. So they'll usually go after the foliage, but here's an image where they were chewing on the flower as well. Flea beetles are very small, but when they feed, they kind of, we call it pitting. So you can see these holes where it might, they might chew all the way through, or they just might leave little pits on that. So this is on a bean leaf. And then over here, we see it on our broccoli leaf. And then, like I said, some of the larvae life stages might cause problems as well. So we know about the Colorado potato beetle larvae, they can cause a lot of feeding damage. And then some species of flea beetles, their larvae, they can cause feeding damage on the tuber portion of the potato. So you can see these lines, that's where the larvae was feeding. So just to kind of, in summary, growers, they might say, oh, I, something's eating my leaves, what can I spray? So you first you can ask them if it is a beetle and then kind of go over these examples and kind of narrow it down with them. So, <clears throat> so this list might look familiar. Again, I have it sorted by the active ingredients that are available in different products. And a lot of these are the same as the caterpillar ones. There's a little bit less, 
But a lot of these products that you see in garden centers, if you read the labels, they'll say they control 100 plus bugs or 100 plus insect species or 500 plus insect species. So they're called, they're, they're like broad spectrum. So they can control multiple species. So I won't read these off again, but again, there's mode of action one and mode of action three, which kills by direct contact pretty much. And then we have neem oil. And then it's always important to just to read the label. So if they specifically know they have Colorado potato beetles, look at that label and see if it's listed for Colorado potato beetles or see if a product um, specifically is emphasized for Colorado potato beetles or whatever other beetle pest. So aphids, the four that we, or I guess I should say aphids, like we talked about earlier, they're small, soft-bodied, pear-shaped insects. They have these two tail-type-like appendages that we call cornicles. And then the four species that we usually see on our vegetable crops are the melon aphids, cabbage aphids, potato aphids, and then green peach aphids. So I won't go into too much detail, but basically they live in these colonies and they can cause cupping, we call the leaves, where they kind of suck with their piercing sucking mouth parts, the different saps and juices out of the plants and the leaves will curl and that will kind of create a little home for them or a protected environment. And another concern with aphids is they can spread different viruses. So the cucumber mosaic virus, alfalfa mosaic virus, and watermelon mosaic virus. So those are just three examples of common viruses that are spread by aphids. So I have a video here where you can see the aphid. What they do is they feed, they'll suck in that virus, and then that virus will get to their salival glands. And then when they go to a brand new plant to feed, they're spreading that virus. So if you have clients that come into the garden center, they're asking about viruses. There's no insect or there's no pesticides to control a virus, but what they're wanting to control is the aphid species. So here I listed some active ingredients that are found in common garden center products again that are labeled to control aphids. So we have quite a few options. There's a lot of products out there, but malathion, um, it's synthetic. It's classified as mode of action one. So again, it affects the nerve and muscles of the insects. Um, we have, so these are all organic options. So they're not classified, but there's potassium salts of fatty acids, which is just a fancy name for insecticidal soap which a lot of garden centers sell. Neem oil, it's a naturally occurring pesticide. It's very popular for organic growers. Um, basically, it's just covering the aphids or whatever pests and it's kind of suffocating or interfering with their hormones. And then same with as a Duractin, that from, comes from a plant material. And then again, we have this list of mode of action group three. These are all nerve and muscle affecting products. Okay, so next is true bug pests. And you guys will get a lot of questions about squash bugs and stink bugs, but basically they're both, they're all, the whole family is called, they're in the true bug family in the order Hemiptera. And they get, they're, they're all in the same family because they have these piercing, sucking mouth parts. So stink bugs, they feed by causing these lesions, pits, depressions, or these ugly cat facing deformities on our vegetable crops. So here's a photo where they're feeding into the tomato and you can get this clouding and kind of different puncture wounds. And then of course, squash bugs, we know that both the adults and nymphs, they'll feed on the leaves, vines, fruits with the piercing sucking mouth parts. And then the squash bugs, they'll suck sap from the plants and that can disrupt the flow of water, nutrients, and they can cause this wilting. So you can see there's crop damage results from reduced yields and fruit quality and storage loss. So, Again, these are active ingredients that are available in products to control different true bug species. However, I would say controlling um, different 
controlling squash bugs and stink bugs with pesticides can be challenging because just their body types, it's almost, they have kind of these hard shields almost, I would describe it. And it makes it difficult for the pesticides to be able to penetrate unless you spray it on the younger, softer instars. But nevertheless, there are products out there if a grower decides the problem is really bad and they need a pesticide product. So we have products like Harborol, which is synthetic, um, Cyfluthrin, Deltamethrin, Essenfenvalerate, Zeta Cypeth. Zeta, cypermethrin, bifenthrin, pyrethrins, and permethrin products are also available. So lastly, clients might ask about what they can do to control various fungal diseases that they're seeing on their vegetables. So like with insect pests, it's important to know the crop they're having the fungus problem on, and then figuring out if they can specific, if you can work with them to specifically identify what the fungus could be. So in January, our team, we put together this guide for our vegetable crops, along with diseases that have been reported in Utah. And this is available on our website. So I would definitely, definitely recommend printing this out to have for your employees at the garden center. And you can even show clients that come in. But essentially it goes over all the vegetable crops and then the common diseases that have been reported in Utah to affect those crops. Um, I put photos of just a few common diseases that we can see that we see on our vegetable crops. So leaf blights, powdery mildews, different leaf molds, botrytis is common in greenhouse settings and different fruit rots. And then as I was studying a lot of these products and the labels, a lot of the fungicides that we have available, they're kind of broad spectrum. So they, they can kill a lot of different funguses, but I would still always recommend, or I would have still always recommend looking at the label to verify if specific diseases are listed on the product label. And for fungicides, there's a whole different list of mode of actions that are different than the insecticides. So for example, the mode of action one uses chemicals that affect different multi or multiple sites within, with on, on the fungus, if that makes sense. So just remember the M stands for multi-site activity. So there's a lot of copper, copper and sulfur products that are, sorry, copper and sulfur are active ingredients used in a lot of products for fungicides. Um, Mode of action M5 acts the same way. This is chlorothalonol. And mode of action three, this, this mode of action kind of affects the fungal cell membrane. So these products can, or sorry, these products include active ingredients like mycobutanol. And then there's organic products too that work just by covering the disease portion of the plant. So again, insecticidal soap, mineral oils, plant-based oils. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention there's Bacillus subtilis, which is in mode of action 44. And it's just a naturally occurring bacterium similar to Bt that kills a fungi by direct contact. So again, I just want to reemphasize, always look at the label. First review this chart, understand what disease is present, and then review the label just to make sure that it, it is covered. So we so the, all the products I mentioned earlier, those are available for homeowners that you might see in garden centers. But they if you go to our website, extension.usu.edu slash vegetable guide we put together some pesticide tables. So these are all organized by vegetable groups. So your brassica crops, your tomatoes, sweet corn, potatoes. And we have all the products listed that you can spray. So we have the active ingredient, the brand name, mode of action, residual days, the different insect pests or diseases will mark whether or not that product controls them. 
And this is just a great tool that you can get online or you can just bring it up on your phone. So if you're in the garden center, I would just recommend saving this website to your Safari tab. So that way you can just always bring it up and it's a quick tool to look for different products and be able to recommend the correct products for the correct problems, if that makes sense. So here's my contact information. You can email me, you can call me, and I would be willing to work with you guys on any pesticide questions, better understanding the labels and just understanding different vegetable diseases that are out there.